Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to Lutheran Church of the Lakes. It's wonderful to be with you here on this Sunday morning. A beautiful Sunday morning. Today we're continuing our, our concept from last week. Last week we had started a, a four-week discussion series about well, imitating Jesus in a specific kind of way. I had a triangle up there. We talked about up, in, and, and out. The relationships that, that Jesus had and the relationships that we seek to have. Granted, he's perfect, we're not, so there's a lot of grace. That's why we come here. That's why we hear our sins forgiven. But yet, today we are going to focus on that up relationship that Jesus had and our up relationship with our Lord. And of course, one of the best ways to do that is together, right here in worship. So if you'd please stand and join me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We confess. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
for the ransom of their life is costly. And can never suffice. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them people approve of their goals. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. But God will ransom my soul from the powers of Sheol. For he will deceive me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hear this, all peoples. Introduction to the Book of Ezra. The Book of Ezra.
desert begins where Second Chronicles ends. As prophesied by Isaiah, the Persian king Cyrus had sent exiles led by Zerubbabel back to Jerusalem in 538 BC. Persia had defeated Babylon in 539. Despite opposition from the non-Jewish inhabitants of Judea, and after encouragement by the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the temple was rebuilt. Then in 458, Ezra led the second of three waves of returning exiles. By the time Ezra arrived, the people had again fallen into sin. Ezra preached God's word and the people repented. Ezra succeeded because God's hand was upon him. This book, perhaps written by Ezra, shows God's power in covenant faithfulness, moving even pagan kings to accomplish his redemptive purposes. The first reading is from Ezra, the first chapter. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of the God that is in Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for a final reading.
God's grace, his mercy, and his peace be to you, now and forever. Amen. In those days, Jesus went up the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Elsewhere it says, as Jesus returned in power by the Spirit, he began to teach in the synagogues. Elsewhere, Jesus broke bread and he gave thanks. And when Jesus went to the garden with his disciples to pray, he withdrew from them to solitude. Over and over again, the Gospels show our perfect Lord engaged in his relationship up with the Father in heaven who sent him into creation to redeem us from death and life. He sought the Father's will. Refreshing himself in prayer and in solitude, he gave thanks to the Lord, whether he was alone or with others, he worshipped as was customary. Would you please uh, give me that screen there, Felipe? Last week, I presented to you this way of organizing the scriptures in our heads. It's up, in, and out. The, the three relationships that we see Jesus have, well, with his Father, up, with his disciples, with those closest to him, in, and of course, with the unbelieving, hurting, sometimes just dirty world, out. Like any good three-sided object, to be kept in balance for him, it was easy. He is perfect. He is God in flesh. And so he modeled for us a life that was kept in balance with all the relationships that Scripture tells us are important to be connected to the Father, to be connected inwardly as we are one body, and to be connected out as ambassadors to the unbelieving world. We seek to imitate Jesus, to maintain balance while remembering that we live in grace and forgiveness, as you already have heard and remembered and received this morning. We need that grace and forgiveness, and, and I, I don't just want to sprinkle that in, it's part of this, because this topic is hard. Imitating Jesus is, it is law. That's what makes this a challenging four weeks for me. This is the Bible saying, do and be differently than our sinful selves allow us to be. And so we seek to imitate the perfect one. And so we suffuse our lives with grace. We receive forgiveness. We receive the body and blood of Christ, knowing that we have peace because we are not perfect. But yet we seek to imitate him. And so today we're going to focus on that blue one there, up, our relationship that we have with God. We don't just want to focus on that, and we'll talk about that alone, to the exclusion of everything else. We want to keep these things in balance, but today we are going to focus on up. And so I, I chose, as we continue to go through one book of the Bible each week, there's not many books left, there's not many weeks left until we hit a new church here, actually. But today we're in the book of Ezra. And I thought it was a wonderful Old Testament example of what it looks like to have that relationship up with God. See, Ezra, he comes at a weird time. Nehemiah, Ezra, uh, they had been in exile. The kings are gone, and yet now God, using his power and goodness for them, has allowed them to start to return piece by piece back to Jerusalem. And when they get there, the first thing they need to do is worship. Now, by the time Ezra gets there, they have worshipped and already started to fall away again. But when Ezra returns and he gets there, with him and other godly men, they return to worship. They return people back, not to the local gods that had kind of invaded with the new people, and not to foreign gods that they had been under, but to the God. To the one God who has organized everything good for them, who has brought them back and given them chance and chance again and again, life and life. And so we hear in our third, our second reading today from Ezra chapter 3 that one of the first things they did was they rebuilt the altar. And they began their worship as God had given it to them. They restarted and, and continued and kept up their habitual life of, of worship and sacrifice and of fear 
by offering to God those sacrifices on the altar as was correct and appointed. They celebrated the Feast of Booths as was good and appointed for them. They returned and worshipped to their God before the city that had crumbled around them before was secure and pristine and as beautiful as it once was. Their focus when Ezra got there was how do we have connection with our God? How do we have relationship up? And they knew that because they had already seen it just in the few years preceding. If they are not connected up to the Father, then nothing else is going to go right for them. Nothing. They will fight inwardly. They will not be a blessing to those outside of them. They needed relationship up to keep them in their identity of God's people. And so that's what Ezra does. And of course, the story of Ezra, go check it out at home, is blessed by God the whole time, with foreign kings, Gentiles no less, organizing the way, paving the way for them to worship their God. But when they returned back to their, well, back to their home, back to the holy city, their first priority was the connection to God. Repair that. Repair the altar. Repair the ways that we worship Him and be connected to our God. Now that one is from the Old Testament, which just proves the point that when you look at the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, no matter where you see people that are connected to God, you see them maintaining a relationship of faith and trust and fear to the one who created and sustains them. You can look through the entire Bible, and the people who are following the Lord are kept connected to Him. We see people in the Old Testament and New Testament, they are gathering and praying. They are baptizing and, and praising. They commune, they worship, they obey, they surrender, and they sacrifice. All of it to God. All of it building that relationship with the Creator. This is their way of being God's people. Of acknowledging that this is the one right here who has redeemed and forgiven and saved us. This is the one who gives us life and promise and promise of eternal life and Messiah and salvation. This is the people of God connected to Him. When we think of that element of our life, our relationship with God, our up relationship, we consider ourselves as one now, in not just the New Testament, but the nowadays, the post-risen Jesus Christ, we have a title of disciple, a relationship that is changed, different. We are now called to be an imitator of another person. That's what disciple means. And so we disciple Jesus, we imitate him, he was in relationship with his Father, so too are we. We seek to sustain and build and, and just ingrain that relationship of God into our very core and our very being. And we seek to grow as disciples, gauging our faith, receiving God's gifts, and simply being his, trusting and praising him. Now these are... I think when we go to share stories about other Christians, these are the ones, at least to me, that seem to stick. These are the ones that we end up sharing, right? Those moments that people have incredible faith and incredible stories. These are the ones that get passed around through the ages. These are the ones that get passed around the earth. People who, despite whatever circumstances they are in, are engaged up in their relationship to God, and he gives them sustaining life. And so there's no end of stories, but this is one uh, that, that stuck with me. I, I read a book, um, and for the life of me right now, because of course it's, I'm up here, I can't remember the name of it, it's on my desk. And uh, actually at our church uh, pastor's conference, the, he's going to come and speak, Rob Draher, uh, Live Not By Lies, there it is. And he talks about in this a lot of terrifying things of when communism and socialism came over the eastern bloc of Europe, what happened to Christians? And it was nothing good, to put it shortly. But there was one story in there that, that I wanted to share with you. And this one's a little intense, right? This is persecution. And yet through it we see God blessing him and him responding in faith up to God. 
In 1950s, early 1950s, in socialist Czechoslovakia, there was a Christian, a brother of ours named Sylvester Kirchner, and he was taken into custody by the government because he was a Christian. Kirchmary was put into isolation, prison, you know, just by himself, and was subject to infrequent torture, but really just the denial of good life that came from being in prison. And as much as he craved relationship in with other Christians, he was often denied that joy of, of having other disciples of Jesus with him. So for various times, he says all he had was his relationship up with God, everything else denied to him. And he said, Kirkbury, that while he was in prison, I brought with me years of Bible study, of worship, and of personal devotion. That's what he took into prison with him. And he said that only that faith ingrained in me from God could guarantee my safety and my life. So to stay sane and in faith, Kirk Murray spent his days of isolation memorizing scripture from a smuggled Bible that he had managed to receive. And he prayed the Psalms. He sang the hymns that he knew from church, and he recited the liturgy, the, moment, the elements of service that he could remember from being there every Sunday. That is what he says kept him not just sane, not just alive, but in faith. So that when he was released, he was still deeply connected to his Savior. He, through all of that challenge, took everything that God had given him and built him in their long-term relationship with God and Sylvester. And that was his own relationship that gave him life. Now that's an extreme story, right? One, one that does happen around the world still today, but... I think most of our lives hopefully don't look like that. Not at least here at LCOL. And so there are other examples. We hear these all the time. In fact, when you guys talk to me, you tell me about them. But, but I thought there was a funny way to, to show this, of our faith. And, and it's a story from Martin Luther. Martin Luther had, I'm going to call it a habit, of sitting at tables with people and just talking. That's how you know he was a pastor. And, uh, Back then, you know, things being what they were, they, they had beer, because that was good drinking water, and uh, they would talk. And so a lot of this was written down in a lot of books called Table Talk by Martin Luther. But there was one incident where you can imagine sitting at the table with this guy. Martin Luther's across the table from you, and there's this dog. He calls it a puppy, and it's just looking at him. You know it, right? You've been to the house. If you've been to my house, you've seen my little poodle mix thing, how they just sit there perfectly, and they just stare right at you because you have food. And so Martin Luther says, when he was at the table, he saw a puppy looking for a morsel from his master. And it washed with open mouth and motionless eyes. And Martin Luther said, Oh, if only I could pray the way this dog watches this meat. All his thoughts are concentrated on that one piece of meat. Otherwise, he has no thought, wish, or hope. Martin Luther suggests that we should be that dog. Looking to God, always eyes affixed, just waiting, drooling, Lord, what more good do you have for me? What do you have for me, Lord? And that ultimately is what our up relationship is. Looking to God and going, I am yours. Somehow you are mine despite my sin. And yet, here I am waiting for what you have for me. And that's where I think we find most of ourselves in our lives. Not, not in prison like Kirchmarie in Czechoslovakia, but rather just spending our days looking up to God and going, God, what do you have for me today? What do I have to get from you? And so whether we're in those most extreme circumstances, because there are Christians around the world who are, or whether we're going about our normal day, like Luther and his dog, it is amazing that God invites you and I to be with him, to talk to him, to, to be in his very presence, to receive forgiveness of our sins, to have peace in our busy souls, and to even eat and drink his own body and blood. We are invited to worship, 
and to receive. God invites you and me, sinners, to come into relationship eternally with him each and every day, a new day where we look and receive his blessings. So let me invite you. As we consider our relationship up with God, and we reflect on the whole triangle, right? We're trying to keep this in balance. Let me, let me ask you as you start to think about this. Is up maybe your most natural thing? I have met so many people who wish they could have prayed or studied the Bible once in a week. And I've been there in parts of my life. I've also met people who this came so natural for them that it, for them it was like breathing. So is this a natural thing for you? Is it where you're strongest? Or maybe... Right now, it's your weakest. Well, let me encourage you to keep it in balance. Right? I say about this one, the up, don't become a monk. Right? If we were to be a monk, that would be a blessing because we would have time, a little bit in with those around us, but a lot of time with God. But we'd be not a lot of use to the outside world. That's why Luther said we should not have monks. That's why, well, he stopped. But we do always need to stay connected to God. Because from our relationship up, we are then blessed for those in with us. We bless each other when we are connected by God. We share God's word. We bring faith. We lift each other up and hold each other as a team of God's people, as one body. And when we are connected up to God, we remember his mission, his purpose to save the broken. And that is a blessing for those who are outside of God's kingdom currently. So consider, when, when you pray, how you pray, consider that relationship up. What does it look like for you to trust in God through hard times? We've all been in hard times. How do we gather for worship? How do we receive Holy Communion? When we have spare time, do we use it all on other stuff, or do we take a moment and dedicate some of it back to our relationship with God? And do we give back to God what he has given us, or are there things we're holding back even from the giver himself? These are all elements to our up relationship. And so let me invite you to look in that mirror of the law today, to see ourselves in our up relationship with God. The law questions us to fight our sin, to recognize it, and to seek to imitate Jesus. But it also breaks us. None of us in here today can say, I have a perfect relationship with God like Jesus does. And I wouldn't expect you to say that. If you did, I'd correct you anyways. So let me remind you of the good news. You are not the one who has to be perfect. You can't be. Rather, you do have a relationship with God who is perfect. A God who loves you, a sinner enough to send his son to be perfect, to die on a cross for you. A son whose up relationship with the Father was, was so perfect that he lived his will even to death. You are now God's child. Go in his peace. Seek to imitate your Lord. Seek a life of balance this week up, in, and out. And consider your relationship with God, where it can grow where it can spread and bless in and out. And may you and I grow closer to God this week in every good gift he has. Amen. Now I invite you to stand and join me for it, please. As we use the words of the Nicene Creed to remind us of our God who is in relationship with us. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation. 
suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.